All right, we're back for part three in the final part of Teachers Teaching Teachers uh, with Margaret Dunn, Nick Hudson, Jim McGillivray, and Mick O'Neill. Thanks again, everyone, for, for taking the time. So we've talked about the past, we've talked about the present uh, in the pandemic situation, but let's look to the future a little bit more. Uh, Mick O'Neill, um, you know, silver linings from the pandemic uh, when it comes to teachers and working with students. Uh, what have you taken away? I think the, the biggest thing I've taken away is that even though I've not been able to be in person with my, my pupils, this, they're still inspired by great pieces of music. So if you're presenting something to them that you want them to learn, um, they're still completely engaged uh, by brilliant music. And that, uh, and that in itself has uh, allowed them to continue their musical journey and progress their skill level, uh, even though they're not face to face with their instructor. Uh, and they and their instructor have perhaps never embarked upon an online um, situation at all. Like myself, I'd never taught online, never until this happened. And on the Friday, I went away from work and on the Monday I was teaching online and it was just as like that. And uh, I think the for the most part, uh, my, my pupils have uh, embraced it and have definitely progressed. And great music is great music, no matter what, uh, what way it's being taught. And it will still in inspire people who want to learn. Mm -hmm. And Margaret, uh, is that resonating with you as well? I know that, uh, I mean, you had the, uh, the kind of uh, remarkable thing where you've managed the class system of, of amateur uh, competitions all going online as well. Yeah, I mean, I think the silver lining was that it gave pipers and drummers, I'm sure worldwide, uh, a platform to either take lessons from anywhere in the world, um, attend schools they maybe wouldn't have otherwise been able to attend and compete if that's what they, you know, they wanted to do. So I, I, I saw it with CLASP myself, the membership really soared um, over lockdown and just more people, you know, it just made it possible for people to connect as well um, or compete glo more globally. Um, or attend a school with people from all over the world. So I think even though we were locked down, it you know it allowed people to maybe connect as well with pipers and drummers. Maybe they wouldn't normally have uh, been able to connect with. Yeah, it, it, it seems like the class uh, system could well become uh, remain more international, as will the National Piping Center more international piping center because of uh, online realizations more than ever. Uh, Nick Hudson, um, you know, you mentioned in the previous part about, uh, you know, in uh, uh, Piper's students having to manipulate their instrument, uh, work with reeds more on their own. Um, and this was something the, the Doctors of Piping uh, video panel had mentioned uh, that, you know, the coronavirus and health and safety has, uh, they sort of predicted that uh, a lot more uh, young pipers or new pipers and drummers will learn more about their instrument because they have to do it themselves. Uh, is hearing you right about that, that that would be a silver lining? Absolutely. And I do think that there are, uh, you know, additional technology that makes that easier than ever. So like, I think the current crop of bagpipe tuning apps, um, it's just more fully featured and just much easier for students to be able to get this visual of what they want their ear to be hearing, um, to just sort of set their channel, lock that in. Um, still not a great way to, you know, tune your drones with a tuner unless you have some external mic. So you're still forced to, you know, really train your ear. But a lot of the, you know, like you mentioned, the read manipulation and things like that, working with tape, those are things that students did get better at just because they were forced to. Um, and it's something we've sort of continued with just because, you know, I don't want to pull your channel out, blow your read. Um, you know, that independence is helpful. And I, I sort of think that that's a pretty powerful thing um, in the long term that you know we get a fairly high attrition rate of students when they graduate so they've played you know at a decent standard uh had their pipe tuned up set up you know a few times a week and then they'll go off to school and yeah of course there's all kinds of things competing for their attention maybe they're just burned out um after a lot of years of playing the pipes but also if they can't tune their instrument if they can't set it up on their own there's nothing worse than playing a really bad bagpipe 
you know, that's inefficient or you just can't get in tune. And so you just put it under the bed, you know. Um, so I, I think that if we can through this, if we can um, kind of keep up equipping people to be more independent um, with the setup of their instrument, the read manipulation, the read, you know, just picking good reads, knowing how to do that stuff, knowing how to dial their instrument in, we may see, you know, more people continuing with it um, and enjoying it, even just on a hobby level, um, you know, after they graduate school or stop lessons or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that really, really in interesting and thought provoking. And Jim, uh, you know, uh, you've you had already done a lot of uh, you know, training material for manipulation of the instrument. So you kind of maybe a little bit ahead on in that regard, but are you, is what uh, Nick and, and everyone else, is that resonating with you too? Um, in, ter in terms of, you know, the hardest thing is, is bagpipe maintenance over Zoom. Um, and I find that the students need a, a certain level, at least to a achieved a certain level of proficiency on the instrument before we they can do um, much in the way of maintenance. So certainly in our case at school, we had just, just before the pandemic, we had about four or five students who we had literally just given pipes to. They didn't even have a drone yet. They were just blowing the goose um, and, or maybe they had one drone and, and then we sent them away. and. You know the reeds dried out, or they broke the, broke the corner off the reed, and and at that point it was pretty tough to to counsel a student who has done almost nothing on the bagpipe to uh, to play the bagpipe. So that that was a real that was a real disadvantage. I, I certainly will I'll agree with Margaret that one of the great one of the silver linings of the pandemic, and there weren't many, um, was the opportunities we had and made to deal with people all over the world. I look specifically at Lou Lenaro and Daniel Carr, who took their, their world bagpipe tour and saw about 20 different instructors all over the world. Um, and, and we taught summer schools that had people from all over the world, which we never would have had if it had been an in-person summer school. So, so yeah, there were, there were some, some silver linings, but, uh, but, but not many. <laughs> And why don't we stick with you, Jim? Like, uh, you know, what would you like to see piping and drumming do differently, uh, you know, going forward? Maybe, you know, it can in include on a teacher-student sort of level, but maybe just in general. Um, how do we build for the future based on what we've seen over the last year and a half? Um, I don't I don't think, uh, we've certainly see, seen the need for teaching, especially in, in North America. I mean, in Scotland right now, there's so much teaching going on in the schools and they're in such great shape. I know in Ontario, Ontario and probably other areas in North America, um, we've, we've reached sort of the end of the, of the era of, of Scottish immigration. Um, bringing pipers and, 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 and that culture to us. And now, now we're having to make our, make our own, um, make our own, our own bagpipe culture. Um, and you know, some of the online stuff might help, you know, we're looking at stuff in the advisor council ways of unifying Ontario piping and, and a big part of that may, may be online. Um, so just continuing to build and to teach, I don't think, our, our long-term goals are any different now than they were before the pandemic. Hmm. Uh, Nick, uh, in Houston, uh, you seeing the same sorts of, of thing? You have the same thoughts around there? Or what are you saying? Um, as far as pushing things in a different direction? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, what should we do differently uh, based on your learnings? Is it a turning point or or just your general thoughts are in that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I do find it's a challenge um, where if I'm teaching a private student, my approach is different than if I'm teaching a student at the school that's part of the band program. That's a little bit more focused on this, you know, very concrete goal of getting into the band. And it can feel a little bit like a, an assembly line at times, you know, and you, you feel like you're crunched for time and you maybe don't have time to do all the nice additional things like you know let's work on writing a tune or let's work on some more theory or you know um whatever it may be 
um, it, fe it feels like there's not always room for that. And like a lot of uh, classroom academic settings, you know, you're you're teaching to the test, and in our case, you know, the test is a contest. Um, so just you know, finding ways to be creative and getting not doing away with that, but enriching that, doing more, um, finding ways to kind of help people from uh, reaching, you know, hitting burnout or whatever um, that you can kind of obviously get in the competition world. I, I would like to see, um, you know, from an association side of things, uh, more innovation, but that's really challenging because these are volunteer led organizations. Um, and there's a lot of work, you know, being put into just keeping the existing system running. Um, but I, I think it's difficult for that a lot of things to pick up momentum if there's not money behind it um, or if there's not some sort of institutional support behind it. Um, Glasgow has this incredible trad scene. Um, there's so much support for Kaylee bands. They get a lot of work. Um, so there's a huge push for people to play in those kind of groups. And I think the challenge in the US is there's just not nearly the level of work um, available for like a group like that. So uh, they have to really be inspired, um, put a lot of work in and maybe not get a lot out of it for a fair while. Yeah. Uh, and Margaret, uh, you know, given what Nick has said about uh, Glasgow and the opportunities and, and you're a, a graduate of the conservatoire of your, yourself, uh, uh, you know, do you, do you, would you agree with Nick in that regard about other opportunities for, for pipers and drummers? Yeah, I, I think um, actually going back to the online format, I think it created some, you know, for example, the piping centre, the junior competition opened a freestyle event this year because it was online. It's something you probably couldn't do in person, of course, but I think people have had a little bit more time over lockdown and probably more time to be creative. There's been lots of new music. There's been books published. So I think moving forward, it would be nice to hear new music and um, maybe more events slightly outside the box, um, just to encourage more creativity and just something different. You know, it's it, people over this period may have had time to reflect and think, well, do I want to go back um, to the band? And I've done that for so many years. It's, you know, maybe they, you know, it might be a turning point where they maybe think, well, I'd prefer to do something different if everything's going to stay the same. So it might be just a, a, an opportune time to think about maybe slightly outside the box musically anyway. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. And Mick, uh, you know, your perspective, you're, you know, not only your instructor full time with uh, Watson's, but, you know, you're lead drummer of Police Scotland Five. Uh, so you've kind of seen the combination of two things, uh, you know, very young people and then uh, some of the more most accomplished uh, pipers and drummers in, in the UK in your band, your own band. Uh, do you identify with some of those thoughts from Margaret? Yeah, I think what Margaret says definitely has, uh, you know, there's definitely some uh, some elements of it that as a leader of one of the, the grade one bands, I had uh, some worries going back that we would lose uh, a, a great deal of our membership just deciding that, you know, I found some other things to do during the pandemic when we couldn't, you know, play as a band. So I'm just going to go and pursue those things. Um, but I've actually been quite pleasantly surprised by uh, we're, we're back as a band now and uh, everyone seems keen and raring to go. And I think there will be a bit of a bounce back um, of people keen to get going again, keen to get back to what they used to love doing. So, and inevitably there will be some people who decide, well, it's not really for me anymore. I want to go and do something like that. But in my experience so far, I haven't seen too much of that. And hopefully I, I'm not going to see too much of it uh, in, in Police Scotland Fife. Uh, and in the school environment, I've definitely not, as, as I mentioned earlier, we've not had a great, um, downturn in the amount of students that uh, have wanted to keep going, but also those that want to take up the instrument for the first time, even though we've not been out um, and visible to the school community as much as we would normally have been. Um, and therefore that's self-perpetuating in terms of uh, new pupils coming on board. Uh, we've still got a great uptake in terms of piping and drumming at the school uh, of new students. So I, I do think that we do probably need to think about 
moving um, some of the musical aspects of what we do in competition on a little bit. Um, I don't, if we change too quickly, too much, I think that probably would be a mistake and it might put off some of the people who are currently still doing it. Um, but I think change is always good when done in the right measure. And I, and I think if that excites the musicians that are involved in it, and then I'm all for it, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, good thoughts. Okay, let's uh, let's take this home. Uh, you know, maybe start with Margaret. You know, your your advice. What's your best advice for teachers? I mean, you're uh, all four of you are really experienced teachers. What what advice for those teachers out there who might have one or two pupils uh, of their own, or or more? Uh, what would you tell them based on what you've learned? I think there's more online content available, um, free online content. So, for example, um, we did some bite size bagpipe um, videos, which is on the Piping Centre website. It's free to access there. It takes you right from a beginner level up to all Lang Syne. So very short videos. But uh, it was the idea was for kids in lockdown and it's free. And I would say to teachers, send you know if you're teaching students it's a good resource between lessons to use and i i use it for my own students like just go watch that video you can watch it as many times as you want it might be just the top end of the scale and then a little using the top hand of the scale just playing deck the halls so you can get going quite quickly with a tune but whatever it, or high g grace notes you know it's um it's quite a good resource so there's lots of those available for free so i would use them that's that's one thing i would suggest and probably just trying to set a goal for your students so if, if whether it's competition or whether it's the pdqb exams you can get um students from quite early on um you know set a goal it could be inter a practice challenge or competition or it could be do your level two pdqb exam or something just set set a little goal and keep them motivated mm -hmm. good and jim mcgillivray uh what's your best advice that you could uh you could give to teachers right now well certainly over the last year and a half um I spoke, I, I probably we've all seen one of the major issues has, has been motivation, especially le less so in, in teach, teaching students who are competing and who are motivated to compete. Um, certainly um, learning new material, I'll, always making sure I'm sending away a student with something new and interesting to do. Is a, is a big part of it. And again, within the band situation, doing whatever you can to, um, to keep the group, the group will motivate itself if you give them the proper environment to, um, to thrive in. And, and, and uh, we're all, in, in, certainly in our, our school, the, the, the more the boys, the boys can motivate each other and police each other, the better it is for the program. So as much as we can still instill that that sense of motivation and, and discipline into the into the students, the, be, the better the better it will go for them. Mm -hmm. and, and Mick O'Neill, uh, what's your best advice for teachers going forward? I think very similar to, to Margaret and to Jim, uh, I think it's important to uh, inspire your pupils with uh, the music that you're giving them, so that they're engaged, that they they want to learn. Um, and making sure that um, trying to make sure that they're going to have fun playing the music that they're going to be playing. Sometimes that might mean coming away for, if they're in a band environment, coming away from the natural uh, band repertoire just to give them something new. I totally agree with what Jim said there uh, about giving every student when they're going away from a lesson something something that's new, something that that's fresh for them to go away and be challenged by uh, and setting achievable targets and goals for them. Um, so that they feel they can reach those targets. Um, and that will certainly help with their motivation. There's no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll give the last, uh, last word to Nick Hudson, uh, you know, things that you've realized that, uh, that you would recommend for teachers, uh, to teachers to do going forward. I think one of the things, you know, in the pandemic was we were all dealing with this, all these hard things. So it maybe it was a bit easier to have empathy for everyone's struggles, knowing that, you know, there could be all manner of issues 
that you're going through. And that's why you're not maybe prepared for this lesson or whatever. And just kind of giving that little bit extra grace, trying to make people feel positive, feel good. Um, and this is one of the things where I, I'm the biggest hypocrite. Uh, you know, imposter syndrome is real for sure. But uh, it's something I have to kind of always tell myself is, you know, it's easy to focus on the negative things. It's um, often one of the most productive things. Uh, just find the thing you're worst at and attack that thing rather than improving the things you're better at. But you could tell, you could give the old compliment sandwich, something good, something to work on, something good. You could tell someone 10 good things and one bad thing, and they remember the bad thing. They remember that one comment on the score sheet. Maybe even every time they play that measure of the tune, they remember, you know, being in that practice room and being told that thing. Um, so just uh, trying to soften the blow with humor, even if it means kind of playing the fool and being ridiculous or whatever, it's just trying to find ways to make them feel good about themselves. You know, people remember uh, how you made them feel last time they were there. And that really kind of can affect the, the tone of the lesson, just their motivation, that type of thing. Um, and it's a hard thing to teach. And it's a hard thing for me after hearing the 10th person play the same tune in a row, making, rushing the same doubling or whatever. It's hard to approach each person with the same, uh, I don't know, generosity. And also having high standards, not lowering your standards, having high expectations, especially with younger players. If you set the bar low, they tend to hit that bar. If you set the bar high, most of them will kind of hit that bar as long as it is realistic. So just uh, sort of tempering high expectations with positive positivity, humor, and just uh, making them feel good about themselves. Uh, I think that is something that I was more aware of in the pandemic, um, being less negative, and um, something that I certainly need more work on, but something I'm thinking about more out, out, you know, moving forward back into kind of more regular lessons. Yeah, I, terrific, terrific insights, you know, empathy, uh, you know, cutting some slack to people. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, piping and drumming, I think what you say, Nick, uh, it's what we've learned all around, uh, you know, getting through this thing and can apply that to the future. So uh, look, uh, you know, thank you to, uh, to all four of you, uh, Margaret Dunn, Nick Hudson, uh, Jimmy Guillory, Mick O'Neill, you know, four of the top flight teachers in the world doing some great things. Uh, really appreciate the insights. Hopefully Pipestrom's viewers and readers, uh, I'm sure they'll take away from uh, take away a lot of good things from this. So we really appreciate the time you've taken and we'll let you get back to doing your teaching. So thanks again. Thanks, Andrew.